Oh, it's great to be here, and it's so nice to see the uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, Fox News satellite trucks because of the size of... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, this is not a tea party? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, isn't that bizarre? You know, if 300 tea partiers get together, they got... You, all you see is satellite trucks, and anyway. I, uh, th that, to, to, a, to a certain point, I think, uh, speaks to what I want to talk about today. And that is that, in my opinion, democracy in the United States, and frankly because the United States is viewed by much of the world as the standard against which they measure the quality of their own government, democracy in the United States is hanging by a thread, and arguably all around the world, democracy is hanging by a thread. In fact, the, the growth of China, which is a communist dictator, it's not even communist anymore, a dictatorship, basically, is becoming the new model for many countries. They're looking at China going, well, let's do what they're doing, you know, look at that. And, and the problem that, that we're seeing here, and the problem, of course, that is uh, driving China, and I think it's going to bite them eventually, is, is uh, what I would refer to in a technical sense as feudalism or neo-feudalism. It used to be the king owned the land, he owned the people, he owned the, their homes, he owned their clothes, he owned everything right down to the right of the first night. And, and what today's modern version of that, this neo-feudalism, is corporate control. It's, it's corporations owning everything. We're seeing this in politics, for example. Who would have ever thought that Russ Feingold would have a serious challenger who would, who would present, you know, a, a, you know, who could take money out of his own pocket, write a massive check, and, and carpet bomb a state with advertising that would scare the hell out of people. I mean, it's just, it's inconceivable. Who would have thought that a billionaire Meg Whitman could run for governor of California and get the uh, Republican nomination. Who would have thought that a, mu a multimillionaire, Carly Fiorina, whose main claim to fame is that she laid off over 10,000 people, moved those jobs to China, and sleeps well at night as a result of it, and was able to make millions and millions of dollars and use that money to run it. Who would have thought that that's where we would be in America, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? What brought us this is the Supreme Court. No legislature in the United States has ever voted. The United States, uh, the House, the, con the, the Senate, no, no state legislature has ever voted to give human rights or constitutional rights to corporations. Never happened. In fact, if anything, the opposite. Russ Feingold was one of the leaders in this, and, and McCain-Feingold, the, the, you know, the movement to, to limit corporate power in government as one of many examples, and a good guy. But this, has been, this is law that has been made by an organization, an institution, one of the three branches of government, the judiciary, which was not intended to be making law. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to turn this into a, uh, into a lecture on, on the Supreme Court and, and how that works, but this, there's a really important thing to understand here. First of all, this is not new. This is the culmination of something that ha happened the last time there was a massive emergence of concentrated corporate wealth in America. And that was in the 1870s, after the Civil War. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln handed off to the railroad corporations and basically about five men, Samuel Huntington, Jay Gould, there were a couple others whose names are escaping me at the moment. And he handed off to these guys what in today's money would be hundreds of billions of dollars and physically, literally, hundreds of millions of acres of land for free or in grants so that they could build the railroad so he could get war material around the country to fight the Civil War. And those war profiteers became, the, as we went into the Gilded Age, into the 1870s, they became the, the barons of the era. And in the, in, the, in the 1870s, in order to free the slaves, Republicans, oddly enough, in the, this was when the Republican was the Reform Party, actually, the, still the party of Lincoln. It was in the 1880s, it got co-opted by these railroad barons. Ten years later, it would be gone, and it's been gone ever since. But in the 1870s, they, they, they referred to themselves actually as the Radical Republicans. It was a faction within the Republican Party. Passed, wrote, and got passed through the House and Senate and got ratified by three-quarters of the states, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution, which freed the slaves, which stripped out of our Constitution slavery, because it took a constitutional amendment to do that. And in, in, the, in the 14th, yeah, it was a good thing. And in the 14th Amendment, 
there was a, shall we say, oversight. Historically at law in the United States, there are two kinds of persons. There's a natural person, there's you and me. But the law also had to accommodate corporations, governments, churches, unions, other kinds of organizations. It had to have some sort of a way for them to be able to pay taxes, to be held to account by law, to uh, pay prop to own property, to sign contracts, uh, those kinds of things. And so back literally in 7th century England, a second category of person was created legally called artificial person. So for you know, over a thousand years, there had been two kinds of persons when the 14th Amendment was passed, was written, artificial persons and natural persons. And what the 14th Amendment says is that any person born in the, or naturalized in the United States is a citizen thereof, which of course has got the birthers all crazy, but that's a whole other thing. Any person, and, and that no person shall be denied equal protection under the law. Now that's all one actually long run on paragraph and it all starts out with being born or naturalized. Obviously they're talking about human beings here. And in the no person shall be denied equal protection under the law, what they're talking about uh, is obviously the former slaves. In other words, that they shall have the right, African Americans would have the same right in court as everybody else. But the railroads in the 1880s, as they were reaching out to grab more and more power, Found a, found a friend and a guy by the name of Stephen J. Field. He was a Supreme Court justice, or he was, he was on the United States Supreme Court, but back then the nine justices of the Supreme Court also were the nine circuit court judges in the United States. So nine months out of the year they rode the circuit, and then three months out of the year they came back to Washington, D.C., and they were in D.C. And so he was the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, California, you know, or the West Coast, that area. And, and there was a series of what are called the California tax cases, where the railroads came and they said, the 14th Amendment says no person shall be denied equal process, uh, d equal protection under the law. We, the, 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 uh, San, the uh, uh, Southern Pacific Railroad Company, are being taxed 50 cents per mile on our fence posts, on our land, property taxes in Santa Clara County. And in Santa Ana County, we're only being paid a quarter, we're being taxed a quarter a mile. And that's unequal protection. That's the equivalent of saying that if a white person gets it at a lunch counter, a black person um, can't. And that's against the law. That's a violation of the 14th Amendment. And because the 14th Amendment doesn't say natural person, it simply says person, that includes us, the railroads. The first four times the railroads tried this argument, it got, they got laughed out of court. But st they, then they bought Stephen Field. And we know now from the historical record, he had been bribed by the railroads. They were going to support a presidential campaign by him in, in 1892. And he was, as I said, on the Supreme Court. And so he brought a series, he brought three of these things to the Supreme Court. And finally, in 1886, he brought one called Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. And in that decision, well, let me back up a little bit. That decision is identified in most history books. If you go back and read David Corton's When, when Corporations Rule the World, uh, if you go back and read some of uh, Howard Zinn's work, if you go back and read, I believe, if you go back and read, for example, the most famous history of America. It was written by Charles and Mary Beard in the 1930s, the history of the American Republic. Um, it, it was major best. It's still in print. And what all of these books will tell you is that in 1886, the Supreme Court agreed with the railroads that because the word natural didn't precede the word person, that the railroads would also have to have constitutional protections. And they've been getting more and more ever since. They claimed the First Amendment right to lie and to have free speech. This was just ratified in Citizens United back in the 1980s in, in a case that involved Dow Chemical. They, they claimed the Fourth Amendment right of, of, uh, of privacy. In fact, they were claiming that the tobacco companies and the asbestos companies hid their knowledge of their own products for over 50 years using the Fourth Amendment. They used the Fifth Amendment to not testify against themselves, similar things, hiding their crimes. And they used, today, they used the 14th Amendment to say, oh, you don't want a hog farm in your neighborhood, you know, with 20,000 hogs, or you don't want a Walmart in your neighborhood? Well, that's discrimination. You are illegally discriminating against us under the 14th Amendment. Corporations are, are making those arguments. So I was writing a book back in, in the late 90s that was based on actually Thomas Jefferson. It ended up, uh, I ended up writing a whole other book called What Would Jefferson Do? But I set out to write that book. And I had found in the attic of a house that we bought in Vermont, 
a complete 20 volume copy of the collected writings of Thomas Jefferson. Never, only once in the history of this country has it been published in 1909. And I spent two years, I had, we'd sold a business in Atlanta and I was kind of retired. And I spent two years reading these, his personal diaries, his letters, his, all this stuff. And so I was writing this kind of history of America from Jefferson's perspective. And I got up to the 1880s. And I was going to, in my book, just like everybody else in their books, say, and this is when the corporations began to take over, because they really did take over politics to a large extent in the 1880s. And one of the results of that, by the way, was the progressive backlash that led right to fighting Bob and, 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 and his buddies. And it's one of, the, one of the things that gives me optimism about right now is that what we're really seeing is the repeat of an old cycle. So anyhow, I went down to the Vermont uh, Supreme Court building, which has the library, the legal library for the state of Vermont. Vermont's one of two states that was, I was living in Montpelier at the time, one of two states that was a nation before it was a state, that, Vermont and Texas. And so they've got this incredible law library going back to the 1700s. And I said to, uh, to uh, forgetting his name now, anyhow, I said to the librarian, the head librarian, who's also a lawyer, I said, I'd like to see a copy of the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad decision. And he said, oh, you mean the one where corporations became people? And I said, yeah, that one. I would like to check that out. And he says, okay, well, it's down here somewhere. And he took me down the aisles, and we found this old, dusty, original, published in 1889, you know, leather-bound, published by Biggle and Biggs or something like that in New York City. Copy, pulls it off, it blows the dust off the top, pulls and you know, folds through the, the, the aged paper. Uh, paper actually held, held up pretty good if it was made before the 1930s when they started putting acid in it. Those the old books are in good shape. Anyhow, he found it and he says, okay, here's the head note. That's what the uh, clerk of the court wrote. Uh, you can skip that. And here's where the decision starts and it follows for about the next 16, 18 pages. And so I sat down and I read this thing. Now, I had already written the first draft of the chapter about how in 1886 the corporations were given this power. I thought, you know, I knew what I was going to be reading because I'd read it in everybody else's books. And it was conventional wisdom in this country. I mean, there were a few people who had contradicted that, but they had been published in obscure legal journals, and most people didn't even know about them. I gave a speech, for example, at the Vermont Law School the year that my book, Unequal Protection, came out. And there were 300 lawyers and probably about 30 faculty people in the room, and law students and faculty people. And I said, how many of you know that in 1886, in, in Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, the United States Supreme Court granted human rights, person sh personhood rights to corporations, and everybody raised their hand. Okay, so this is how conventional wisdom it is. So anyway, I'm reading this thing, and I get, uh, what it was was basically it was an argument about whether or not the railroad had to pay its taxes on the fence posts, uh, on, the, on the property tax. They measured it by fence, post, fence posts per mile. And I get to the very end, and at the very end, the court rules that the 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 that the uh, that they had to pay their taxes, and that uh, that you know the railroads lost that they had to pay their taxes, and there's this paragraph at the very end, and because th th there were several, I'm paraphrasing from memory, but there were several constitutional arguments that were brought forward before the court, but the court did not see the need to address them because we were able to find the remedy in the California Constitution. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't say corporations are people. It says the opposite. It says we're not even deciding this stuff. So I went back to the, to the librarian and I said, you know, I didn't find it there. And he says, you're kidding. You know, that's, we learned this in law school. And I said, no, I didn't find it there. And so he says, well, let me take a look at it. And he's looking through it and he's, he's like, oh, this is weird. And he says, well, let's check out the head note. Now, the head note is, is a commentary written by the clerk of the court. It has no legal opinion. In fact, in the early 1900s, and I think it was 1904, there was a Supreme Court decision that ruled explicitly that head notes have no legal standing. But in any case, he flips to the head note, second paragraph of the head note, corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and entitled to equal protection under the law. And I'm looking at it, and he's looking at it, and we're going, whoa. And I said, how'd that get there? And he said, I don't know, but it looks like it's a mistake. And I said, oh, really? It... So I took a copy. I, I, made, I paid my 70 cents, and I got a copy of this thing made. And I went around the corner to, to uh, Jim Ritvo, who's a lawyer, who was a friend of mine who just happened to live in Montpelier. And, and I said to Jim, I, I'd laid out all these copies, and I'd highlighted a few things. And I said, Jim, take a look at this. And he says, what is it? I says, 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. He says, oh, when corporations became people. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he's looking at the highlighted stuff and here and there, and then he gets to the very end, and he goes, whoa, that's weird. And I said, yeah, and here, look at the head note. And he looks at the head note, and he goes, holy shit. <laughs> 
And I said, what do you mean? And he said, they contradict each other. And, and I said, how can that be? And he said, I don't know. He said, there's something funny going on here, but this is not what I learned in law school. And, and, and I said, well, what do I do? I thought, you know, I've got the keys to the kingdom here, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, we can take these guys down. <laughs> And he said, I don't know. He said, you need to ask a constitutional scholar. He said, why don't you call Deb Markowitz? She was the Secretary of State. And ask her, because she knows a lot about the Constitution. And she's a lawyer, too. And I said, OK. So I went home. One of the cool things about living in a little state, you call the Secretary of State's office, ring, 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 phone answers. May I speak to Deb Markowitz? This is Deb. <laughs> I said, Deb, you may not remember me, but I had your sign out in front of my house. I live on Northfield Street when you were running. And she says, oh, I remember. You're at 14 Northfield Street. Yeah, that's me. Oh, great. So I had her attention. And I said, I wanted to talk to you about Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. And she said, oh, the decision where corporations became people. And I said, yeah. And so I read her the parts that I'd found. And she said something very similar, but slightly less obscene to what Jim said. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, you know, it's, it's obviously wrong. Obviously, that's not the presidential case. That's not the case that made corporations people. And I said, well, what is? And she said, well, it would be whatever case was the one that quoted that one. And I later found out it was about 15 years later that the Supreme Court quoted that case. And, and I said, well, since that was based on a lie, can't we undo this? And she said, well, unfortunately, no. The court can quote Daffy Duck. Doesn't matter who they quote. Once they make a decision, they've made a decision. And even though they didn't make the decision in 1886, they did in the 1890s. And now, you know, we've added on ever since then. So here we are in this peculiar position, this peculiar situation where a lie, by the way, I, I went back and, and, and wanted to find out who the hell is the guy, who is the clerk of the court, right? His name was by, a fellow by the name of John Chandler Bancroft Davis. And the, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice at the time was a fellow by the name of Morrison Remick Waite. So I went to Washington, D.C., and we're digging through the, the Waite files and the Stephen J. Field files and the, and the Davis files, which hadn't been opened, to the best of my knowledge, in 100 years, as far as I could tell. Maybe, maybe a couple of times by a few legal students or whatever. But. And we found, and it's actually reprinted in the new edition of my book, Unequal Protection, an actual letter in which the clerk of the court says to the chief justice, did you guys have a conversation about corporations being people? And the chief justice writes back to him and says, yes, we did. That was one of the railroad arguments. But it doesn't matter because we didn't base our decision on that. Now, it's, counter it's couched in 18th century legal language, but that's what it says. So why did Davis write this in the headnote? And by the way, the headnote was published three years later. It took a while for books to get published back then. And, and Wait, the chief justice of the court, who denied corporate personhood in his letter to Davis, died the next year of congestive heart failure. So never, he never realized what words were put in his mouth. Turns out John Chandler Bancroft Davis was not only the son of the governor of Massachusetts and the scion of a very wealthy family, he was also the founder and president of the Baltimore New York Railroad. Bingo. So what we have here is a seizure of power in the United States by actors who are claiming constitutional rights yet are not humans, are not persons, and have no legitimate claim to it claiming rights and claiming powers and authorities that have never been legislated into being, literally. The House and Senate have never given this power. In fact, they've done the opposite over and over and over again from the Tillman Act in 1907 to, to, to McCain-Feingold most recently. Repeatedly, Congress has tried to stop the Supreme Court from doing this. We have this coup d'etat that has happened in the United States. We have this massive corporate power. And the question before us now is, what can we do about it? Because the Supreme Court in Citizens United, in this January decision where they said not only are corporations persons, not only do they have the Fourth Amendment right like Dow Chemical had when they claimed that, that when a plane flew over from the EPA and took pictures of them emitting poisons, that was a violation of their, of their privacy rights. Although if you go to work for that corporation, they can take blood out of your body, they can take your bodily fluids, they can listen to your, your phone conversations, they can monitor your emails, you've got no privacy rights. But the corporation keeps their privacy rights 24-7. Not, not only do the corporations have Fourth Amendment rights, not only have Fifth Amendment rights not to testify against themselves, and so when my father was dying of a, of a, of a cancer induced by asbestos, uh, mesothelioma, 
27 lawyers from the asbestos company showed up in our little living room to harass and, and, and uh, depose this guy against his one lawyer. I mean, you know, this is the, the power of these corporations. It was, they had to stand in the, in the doorway. There wasn't enough room physically. In the, and my dad is dying, and these guys are, are, are yelling at him for the videotape for the camera. Not only do they, they claim the Fifth Amendment right to lie about what they knew about their own products, the first publication, by the way, in the United States in a scientific journal about how asbestos causes cancer was in 1934. Not only have they claimed the 14th Amendment right to force Walmarts and hog farms and waste disposal plants and God only knows what else on us, and the 14th Amendment right to move our jobs overseas and tell us to go screw ourselves, not only have they claimed all that, but they've also claimed the right to buy our politicians and they are doing it. And among them, the people who are them, the, 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 the owners of these corporations and the beneficiaries of these corporations, the Meg Whitmans of the world, the Carly Fiorinas of the world, they're now even trying to buy their way into our political pro process. Uh, the same with, ben Fe uh, with, uh, with Senator Feingold, Russ Feingold's opponent. What do we do about this? The pro the, 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 the only, there's only two ways this can be changed. One is for one of the right-wing Supreme Court justices to either retire or die, and I'm not wishing ill on any of them, and for there to be a Democrat in the White House who appoints a progressive justice to the Supreme Court. Which is one of the reasons it's so important that we work in this political cycle and in, and in the next one, two years from now, don't give up and get out there and make sure that President Obama is re-elected. This is vital because odds are, you know, several of the conservative justices are getting a little old, number one. The other is that Congress can pass an amendment to the Constitution saying, you know that word person in the 14th Amendment? It means natural, right? It's natural persons, it's people. There is a movement to do this which is being led by people like David Cobb, my good friend, lawyer, Green Party candidate for president out of California, and people like your own Ben Mansky, right here in town, right, right here in this area, who's running for the Green, for state assembly in the Green Party. And I've been part of that movement for, for about a decade now, and uh, the website is movetoamend.org, among others. There's a whole bunch of them that point to it. And they have this constitutional amendment. But the only way that that constitutional amendment is going to get introduced into Congress and passed through Congress is if you and I participate and get enough progressive politicians, anti-corporate politicians, or not even anti-corporate, anti-corporate power, right? Corporations are fine. Corporate power corrupting government is horrible. Anti-corporate power politicians elected to office. The reality is that every single time there has been a progressive, a serious, legitimate, and successful progressive change in the United States, it started with a couple of people in a living room. It started in a small, whether it was the abolition movement, the suffrage movement, regardless, civil rights movement, whatever it may have been, the, 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 uh, the uh, anti-pollution movement, all of them began with small groups of people all over the United States starting local, being active. Do not underestimate the power of participating in things like, for example, Progressive Democrats of America, pdamerica.org, and the other great progressive groups out there. Get to that website and join Tim Carpenter and the other great people who are doing this work. So number one, we've got to get these, we've got to get good politicians elected. Number two, we've got to get active with these things. And, and that means, and, and number three, it means we need to wake up a whole lot of people. You know, because what's really amazing is when I get Tea Partiers on my TV show, on my radio and TV show, setting aside the, the corporate shills, you know, that, we, that occasionally sh pop up, and you can tell that they're shills because they just, you know, they, they just do the corporate line. But when you get the guy, the true believers on, and you say to them, do you really think that a corporation should have the rights under the Constitution of a human being? They will almost unanimously say no. They're on our side on this issue. This is a, an issue of tremendous power. We need to, it, this, if you're gonna, if you're gonna argue politics, you know, I model arguing politics on my radio TV show every single day for people. I, you know, I say I wanna teach you how to have an argument with your brother-in-law over Thanksgiving and without leaving blood on the floor. This is one of those areas where it doesn't even have to be an argument, it can be an education. We need to wake people up. And we get to need to get as many people, right, left, center, doesn't matter, need to get as many people in America as involved as possible in this. And, and the only ones who are going to do it are us. We have to get involved. Tag, you're it.
We'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks for showing up today. <laughs>